Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Very truly I tell you, unless the grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. If it falls into the dank, dark, steaming, humusy soil, into the darkness of death, into the destruction and decaying remains of former life, if it falls into the ground, it will burst open, find the light, become so much more of what it was created to be. It will swell from the tiny seed a mere hint of what could follow and explode into the life-bearing producer of food for the world. Inside every seed is an embryo, and in that embryo is a root, which grows down into the ground and a shoot grows up into the sky. Every embryo has a root and a shoot, and inside that little embryo, every seed has a little on and off mechanism. And when you plant a seed into the ground at 40 degrees, that mechanism goes on. But if the temperature is 20 degrees, the mechanism stays off. There is a miraculous mechanism which goes on and off, now, there is also this thin coat around the seed that protects the oxygen from coming in prematurely. And then, when this dormant seed is planted in the ground at 40 degrees, the switch goes on and the seed takes in water, and it miraculously begins to expand, and the seed coat is broken, and it begins to mature and produces sugar and protein, and then it comes, out comes the little roots and the little shoots, and the shoots produce more seeds, which produce more fruit. That's what happens when a seed dies. It's a miracle. Death precedes life says Jesus, not the other way around, not life precedes death as we are prone to think, as we are prone to try and live and as our world is at pains to illusion us. We believe that fending off death will save us, but Jesus says that such an attempt will always destroy us, that if we give up our lives and fall into the ground, we will find the ground to be God. Find the ground to be the very place of new life. Give up our lives and get it in the true sense. It's hard to believe. It doesn't make sense. Embracing our finiteness does not seem likely to be the way we would find infinity. But it turns out to be so, and Jesus knows it. Because Jesus led the way. The seekers who showed up to Philip and said, we wish to see Jesus, were probably not expecting this, and neither, most likely, were we. But Jesus will teach this to us if we let him. The image of the seed lies at the heart of John's understanding of the meaning of Jesus' death. The death of the single grain brings about the growth of many new seeds. Through Jesus' death on the cross, something new will enter and transform the world. Jesus is preparing the disciples, and Jesus is preparing us through this passage for what lies ahead, his death on the cross. His earthly career must now continue as a dead and risen Christ who will be present and available to the church everywhere. He is present and available to us everywhere. This passage follows the account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, Passover time, in an atmosphere of death and betrayal that is surrounding the festivities. Verses 25 and 26 about those who love their life above all and therefore will lose it 
have a strong resemblance to parallel sayings in the synoptic gospels, as does his mention of taking up one's cross as a part of following Christ. Jesus' death on the cross does not release us from having to go through death or in order to emerge into the fullness of eternal life. The process of transformation from seed to plant, death to resurrection, and this world to eternal life is clearly difficult, a painful process. However, we are provided with a wonderful assurance that through whatever we must endure, we are never alone. And a miraculous new thing will happen. At the heart of the meaning of the cross of Jesus lies the hope and potential of a great cosmic transformation, like the bursting of the shell of the seed into new life, a movement towards the fullness of all that God originally intended for creation. Within the husk of the seed, symbolizing our life on earth, lies the promise of eternal life. And Jesus is the one who has opened the way. I, like many, have allowed myself to be swept into curiosity about the frenzy around the latest movie craze that hit theaters this weekend, Hunger Games, the first of a trilogy of books by Suzanne Collins. I'm always cautious about getting swept into the latest popular fad. I'm getting too old for that anyway, but my daughter was the first who said, Mom, read it. It's really good. And so I am and I will see the movie. But unexpectedly, I came across a fascinating commentary on the book and the movie by one of my favorite theologians, Diana Butler Bass. Diana shares, despite the lack of conventional religious trappings, the major theme of the novel is a deeply theological question, one that has haunted the religious imagination for millennia, Can violence save? The Hunger Games even deals with sacrificial death in such a way that one might draw a comparison with the Christian teaching of Jesus' death as a sacrificial substitution for another. But actions in this story undermine the traditional understanding of self-sacrifice. To save oneself, one must kill others. In the Hunger Games, salvation cannot be accomplished only by death, but by murder. Ultimately, Butler Bass suggests the Hunger Games argues for a human future of love and non-violence by immersing us into the voyeuristic orgy of violence brought about by inequality and injustice. Readers and viewers of the movie must take stock of the limits of violence as a way of freedom and redemption. The Hunger Games points out that the world envisioned by spiritual leaders like Gandhi and Martin Luther King is infinitely preferable to a world of bread and circuses, where the many are controlled by the very few. The future hangs between these two visions. Will we be Panem, which is the post-apocalyptic nation at the center of the story, or some other sort of world? The Hunger Games celebrates faith, faith in family, faith in friendship, faith in song, faith in justice. The Hunger Games proclaims that beyond the fences of fear built to enslave, control, and guard, there is joy beauty, and wonder. In the end, there is true freedom and the hard-earned hope that human beings can create a better world based not in sacrificial violence, but in sacrificial love. I am on a spiritual journey. I trust that you are also. In the past few years, my journey has been heavy with times that have tested me in forces that have seduced me towards stress, unbalanced workload, anxiety about things I could not control, 
Sometimes I've been so tempted to stay in what felt like safety and comfort, to not work hard at finding God inside, inside me and around me, to avoid tears and forgiveness and the unpacking of it all, but to s- excel at what I could control, which is my place and my compassion, my integrity, is all possible with God and with Christ. Thankfully, enough of the time I can identify Christ inside me, offering the water and the soil that, is coat, that the coating could burst forth and, and live in rightness with God, rather than being held in fear and anger. I know that you carry your own similar stories. Keeping a grip on the cross of Christ can be so exhausting and painful I confess there are days I have not and do not do it well. But I know that I can because Jesus is healing my soul. The radical and brutally honest theologian Rob Bell, in writing about his journey with Christ, talked about it in this way. I'm learning that very few people actually live from their heart. Very few live connected with their soul. And those few who do the difficult work, who stare their junk in the face, who get counsel, who let Jesus into all the rooms in their soul that no one ever goes in, they make a difference. They are so different. They're coming from such a different place that their voices inevitably get heard above the others. They are pursuing wholeness and shalom, and it's contagious. In our Lenten series, many of us witnessed to the difficulty of turning to God at such times when our life is feeling dead in many ways. Again, we have Jesus as our guide, our way, and our truth. For in his final hour on the cross, he first turned to his Father God in prayer, saying, my God, my God. Beginning the words of Psalm 22, which he was too weak to continue, and leading those who who were there around the cross, including us, into that psalm of God's faithfulness. Psalm 51 is one of the great penitential psalms, which means feeling regret or seeking penance. The psalmist seeks not merely the removal of guilt, but the restoration of a light, right relationship with God. The request is for a transformed heart and spirit. For Hebrews, heart symbolized the intellect and will, while spirit was the power that made one alive and active. Spirit, in Hebrew, was ruah, the same word for the breath of God flowing through us, our life. So this request is for a new focus and for the strength which will make possible a fresh obedience on God. Let's remember who we are and where we are again We come together in ritual, in song, in prayer, in study, in confession, in sacramental covenant, again and again. And yes, it's often rote. We often go through the motions because it's our habit. But let us remember that deep inside, and even at our surface, we all seek to meet the God who is our creator, Redeemer, companion, savior. We all seek to be loved with the grace that only God can offer. Love not in spite, not in spite of who we are and how we mess up, but in such a way that it really matters no longer. That the forgiveness we receive, that's the forgiveness we receive, a love that asks us, over and over, each day, in our wake and in our sleep, 
To give all this up, to break up the shells around our seeds of hope, all this insecurity, all this trying to do it alone, all this judgment and worry and fear, to burst forward with new life and get it. Get life, joy, and get it forever. And so we sing again, we say again, and we sing again. Create in me, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Mm-hmm.